All right, so uh, this is the R4DS uh, Project Club. Um, and I am John Harmon. If I know those of you here know who I am, but for anyone watching on YouTube, uh, I run the R4DS online learning community. Um, you can find me on uh, most social media at John the Geek. Um, I'm not active on Twitter anymore, but I am on Mastodon and LinkedIn and Blue Sky. Um, that's pretty much it right now. Uh, and you can find these slides at r4ds.io slash rapid talk, and they have links to the various things I'm going to talk about. Um, and also, as I am uh, speaking, if you can't see, like if Zoom is screen up or whatever, and you can't see the slides, uh, you can go to that link, uh, which hopefully has propagated now, and you can find it, uh, and you'll be able to get to the the slides and thanks to the multiplex feature in Quarto, um, as I'm presenting, it should move the slides online as well. So you should see where I am as uh, as I go through. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, this package that I'm working on called Rapid and um, a little bit about the problem I'm trying to solve with it and probably most importantly. Um, how and why I'm using S7, the new object-oriented system in R uh, to solve it. All right, so first I'm gonna need to introduce uh, Open API, which is an important part of this whole endeavor. Um, if you've worked with Plumber, uh, Plumber is a package for creating web APIs in R. If you've worked with that, you may have seen um, Swagger docs, it automatically generates this interface. Uh, I think it says Swagger in a couple of places on that interface um, where you can type in some sample data and see what your API does. And so it lets you like interact with your API. It also like auto doc documents some things about the API that way. Um, well, Swagger is the former name of OpenAPI. Uh, Swagger was developed in house at this uh, website, WordNick. Um, in the early 2010s. Uh, Swagger 2.0 was released in 2014. Most of the internet actually uses that specification. And after that came out, this company SmartBear purchased Swagger uh, in 2015, and they still make the tools called Swagger that work with the work with APIs, but they released the uh, like, definition of Swagger, the, the API definition as this open API. They created the OP, open API initiative as a official Linux foundation open source project. Um, and then under that, the open API initiative has the creates the open API specification, which is a uh, schema that any API um, can follow. So you can describe the API using the schema and then and you when you do that, you create an open API document for your specific API. And I guess backing up just a little bit, an API is a way to like access um, a tool. Uh, technically, an API is just any access application programming interface. That's what it stands for. And then a web API is uh, a way to like access data or tools online. Um, I probably should have that definition <laughs> locked down better. Um, all right, so so what is this open API specification? Um, it's a formal schema to describe web APIs. Uh, it has sections um, like fields within the schema, such as info, where you give the name, the license, the version, that sort of thing. This is actually the only piece of the uh, specification that's required for any given API. Obviously your API doesn't make much sense if it only has a name and version, but that's all you really need to have. Um, it also says you have servers. What are the URLs for uh, your different locations that your API is available through? Uh, and what are the descriptions for each of those URLs? And you can even have variables within the URLs. It has paths. That's the uh, exciting part. That's where you describe um, where to go within your API to do different things and what parameters those endpoints 
uh, require, and then also what responses you should expect from those uh, paths, and et cetera. There's um, a whole bunch of other fields that we will see as we go through this project that I'm doing. Um, and the important thing, or an important thing for me, is that there are multiple versions of the schema. Uh, we're currently on 3.1.0. Um, there's an active group working on finding things that could be clearer and things to improve within the specification. And when I'm working with these things, I only want to have to think about one type of object um, for my use cases. So specifically, I want to use the API definitions to auto-build packages uh, to access those APIs. I actually have a grant from the Arc Consortium that I'm working on this package to Auto generate a another you know any package for any API, and I don't want to have to think about oh is this defined in Swagger 2.0 or Open API 3.1 or something in between, um, and so I wanted to have one place where I think about that like I just do it once, convert it into the standard format, and then once it's in the standard format, do whatever I want to do. I actually have a couple other things that I want to do with these um, beyond just that one package generator. Um, and so that's where this package rapid comes from. Uh, by the way, this hex, hex sticker is uh, very temporary. Um, it's a little too, the white part's a little too fat, I think. So you can't really see, but the letters are made out of waves. Um, if anyone has any artistic talent and wants to turn this into the, the thing that I'm envisioning, that would be very cool. Um, but yeah, so rapid is the name of the package. It is our API definitions, that's where the name comes from. Um, and it exports the rapid uh, class, which is an R object based on the OpenAPI 3.1 specification. Um, the reason I went with 3.1 is uh, that, you know, there's a whole group make, working on this definition, so I shouldn't reinvent the wheel. And uh, like 3.0, is a subset of 3.1 and Swagger uh, 2.0, also known as AP, Open API 2.0, is a little bit different, but you can coerce anything that's in Swagger. You can express that as a uh, Open API 3.1. Um, and so then the idea is that you can take any API definition and turn it into this rapid object, standardized, and then I can use or anyone, but especially I can use that object downstream to do whatever. And so I don't have to think about how was it originally defined. It doesn't matter. It's now a rapid object. Um, you could also actually, even without having the API document, you could use the rapid package to like design your API because it has all of those fields that you're expecting. And eventually I'll have uh, the ability to take the rapid object and go back to a, an API document. And when you have the API document, uh, there are other tools that can help you build packages out of the document. Um, that's actually one of the things I want to do is take the, uh, actually, I think to some degree, um, if you have a Swagger document, I think Plumber has some tools to help you auto-generate your API that way. So um, there are things like that, where if you have the document, you can make the API. Uh, let's help make that happen too. Um, one of the the like aspirational goals I have is there's this thing, Postel's Law. Um, be conservative in what you send, be liberal in what you accept. Uh, this was developed by John Postel, Postel, Postel. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, actually. Uh, he's one of the original architects of the internet. Um, and the, the idea is... You know, you don't know what people are going to send you. The data that they send in could be messy. Um, maybe they have their API document and they don't tell you whether it's a uh, Open API 3.1 versus 3.0 versus Swagger. Even though you're supposed to include that in the document, eh, people might not. Um, they might not have a name for their API in the document. They should have that, but they might not. And so, I want to live by this, um, but. As I'm working on it, I uh, am actually, and you'll see, I'm being kind of strict that you have to exactly follow this thing that I'm looking for. 
because then I'm going to run, uh, there's a collection of like 2,500 uh, API documents at this site, apis.guru. And I'm just going to run them all through and find out which ones throw errors uh, and then use that to figure out, okay, these are the things that I need to uh, loosen up a little bit or deal with so that they still make it through to the, the proper object. All right. So how am I doing that? Well, I'm doing that in S7. Uh, the S7 package was released uh, like two weeks ago or something. It's been under development for a while um, by the uh, a working group um, from the R Consortium. And um, it is a new object-oriented uh, system within R. So what does that mean? Uh, I'm going to give a super quick introduction to object-oriented programming. Uh, the asterisk there is I am not a computer scientist, so I might say some things in a way that you think is strange or that might not be exactly correct, uh, but this is my understanding. So very briefly, um, within any object-oriented system, or I think any object-oriented system, you, have, you tend to have classes, which are like types of things. Um, in R, you have definitely seen classes. So like doubles and integers are classes and those are subclasses of numeric. Um, there are character uh, vectors, there are factors. Factor is technically a subclass of integer. Um, and you know, if you get into the nitty gritty of R, you might see that some of these things are technically types and some of them are classes, but they all are effectively classes. Uh, importantly, like uh, data frame is a class, it's a subclass of list, and tibble is a class, it's a subclass of data frame. Um, so yeah, that's classes. There are objects, which are the actual things, they're the instances of classes. So a particular tibble is an object, um, a particular character vector. Um, there's the built-in character vector letters, and that is an object that is an instance of the character class. There are methods, which are functions to act on objects of a particular class. Um, the, like one of the most basic um, methods in R is the print method. So if you print a tibble, it looks different than if you print a data frame. Um, and so there's a tibble method for print, and there's a data frame method for print. And that's actually one of the key differences between Tibble and data frame. There are two um, kind of broad categories of uh, object-oriented programming systems, uh, encapsulation and generics plus multi-methods. Both of these exist within R. Um, so encapsulation is when the methods are part of the class definition, so that it's all encapsulated, all rolled up together. Um, within R, there's R6 and actually RC, which is built into R, but nobody uses it uh, that I know of. And um, there's also ggproto, which is a type of encapsulated uh, object-oriented programming system. Generally, en encapsulation is good when you have um, a few classes with specific interfaces and you know like each one of those classes has things you can do with that class uh they also I think generally maybe always uh have stateful objects which means if you change the object anywhere it that object it has changed everywhere um which is not how you know that's not how things normally work in R and actually, I haven't looked into it, but I think uh, the fact that um, data tables uh, change in place, you know, the, you edit data tables in place, that means it's probably a type of encapsulated um, object-oriented programming system under the hood, but I'm not sure exactly. I haven't uh, looked into the internals of data tables before. So, um, oh, and just a, a couple of places where you see this type of thing would be shiny. Um, totally makes sense. You want you have a stateful object, which is like the session of uh, that web page as the user is using it. And it, if it changes, if they're, you know, if an input changes anywhere in any function, 
it needs to change everywhere or especially if an output changes. And so Shiny is built on top of R6. Um, Torch, which is the R implementation of um, the underlying library uh, libtorch, which PyTorch famously implements in Python. Um, as the tensors uh, go through and are changed in a neural network, uh, you want to keep track of that state. And so Torch is implemented using R6. And they actually uh, created something that they call R7, which was confusing for a little bit because S3 or S7 was also call, called R7. Um, and R7 is just like their use case of R6 um, that deals with tensors specifically. Um, pretty much everything else in R is uh, using generics plus multi-methods. S3 uses generics plus multi-methods. S4 does as well. I haven't worked with S4 a lot, but it's the same kind of idea. And then S7 uh, is the combination of the two, which I'm going to go into in more detail. Um, so yeah, S3 is like the tidyverse, uses S3 all over the place. And basically most things in R are using S3 in some way. Uh, S4 is really popular with Bioconductor. I haven't done a lot of biology work in R, and so I'm not as familiar with S4. But that's um, it was meant to replace S3, and it just it didn't it didn't take off really um, widely. Like like I said, Bioconductor really strongly adopted it. Um, but you might hear okay, encapsulation is good when you have a few classes with specific, specific interfaces. So you might be wondering why I'm going to talk about S7. Um, that, uh, and my argument is that rapids are still data. I want to be able to make lists of them. I want to put them in tibbles. Um, when I'm going through the 2,500 APIs on apis.guru, I want to work with them like data. And in general, if you're working with data, uh, multi-methods just work better. Uh, and yeah, I, S7 or S4 does have some things that are confusing about it. And S7 has some of that same feel, but I think um, I think it's easier to work with. And so uh, we'll see some of that in a moment. Um, all right. So now let's get into the specifics of S7. So what's going on with S7? Uh, S7, uh, like a Briefly mentioned, it's S3 plus S4. So add them together, you get S7. That's why they skipped all the way up. It has nothing to do with R6. Um, so don't be confused by that. And that's why they renamed it. It was originally named R7 and people thought it was a replacement for R6 and it really isn't. Um, I expect R6 to live on strongly in the S7 world. And uh, I think that the goal is for anything that is written in S3 or S4 should move to S7 going forward. Um, a big difference from S3 is that you formally define classes with this new class function um, versus in S3, you just add a class attribute and voila, you have defined the class. Um, but that in S3, that means that you can have something that's called a tibble, but it totally is not a tibble and won't behave like a tibble. Um, and I hear someone came off mute. So someone have a comment yeah. or thought? Or, yeah. no, that was me. Okay. Uh, sorry, late to the party. But <laughs> the whole like, oh, we're going to ignore R6 thing falls kind of flat because I don't remember S3 or S4 having like a sense of self. Whereas yeah. R6 and S7 both have the concept of like having a self in um, functions and stuff. It has, it it does, but you don't, the only methods you define in an S7, and we'll talk about this in a minute, inside of the S7 are uh, the validator and the constructor. Um, so it's still, it's not Un at all a replacement of doing... R6 getters that depend on each other but it's still just the object it isn't the methods of the object you still define the yeah. methods separate and it's it is not going to replace um r6 and also 
uh, it's not, uh, I mean, the most important thing is it's not stateful. If you pass an S7 into a function and, and change the S7 within that function, you did not change the S7 that you passed in. You changed the copy of the S7 inside of the function versus R6, you do. And so that's that's the most like bottom line difference between them. Um, but yes, it does have some of that, um, you know, it, that's that's basically, that's the S4 part. The S4 had the formal constructors. Um, it's, uh, yeah. So anyway, I'm gonna <laughs> continue on and we'll, we'll look at some specific examples to make part of what we were just saying make a little bit more sense. Um, but it's not it's not the same as R6. You know, it's not gonna be a replacement of R6. All right, so formally define these classes with the new class. Um, and within the classes you have properties and you can formally define properties with new property. Um, you don't often need to do that. I have a couple of examples that I'm going to show, and I'm still trying to decide uh, if they should be properties or if they should just be classes themselves, because the properties of a class can be other classes. So I'm not 100% certain why I went with new property, um, actually. Uh, so we'll be we'll see that. Um, you also formally define generics with new generic in S3. You just make a function and you put use method inside of that function to tell it to uh, that it's a generic basically. Um, and then you also formally define methods with new method. Uh, in S3, you just name a function with that has the name of the generic and then a dot and then the name of the class. Um, that can be really confusing and actually has led to some errors and things before, because there are, for example, data.frames and data.tables. And so if you have, you know, get.data, if that is the name of your generic, and you want to get dot data from a frame, which is an actual uh, potential, it's a possible class that you could have. So get.data.frame, oops, wait, or did I mean get.data frame? Um, that causes confusion, causes craziness. So they said, okay, no, we're going to formally define new methods. Now, technically, everything that's happening in S7 is um, built on top of S3. So you still could run into those issues, but you would have to like work really hard to do so. Uh, so uh, we'll see some of what that means coming up. All right. So rapid, uh, what is, what did, what did I do in S7? And then therefore I can use this to show you some examples of actual S7. All right, so the first thing is this rapid object. Um, this is my main object, like the top of the tree. Um, and as we'll see, as we dig in, it's going to be calling some pieces from other uh, classes that I will define elsewhere. Um, first thing you do is you need to define a new class with S7 new class. Now, like this is in my package at the top level of the package is this call to S7 new class. It makes things a little strange and it uh, looks weird when you're working with it. And we're going to see, um, depending on time, we might see that, that like the file system has to be weird because as the package like loads um, or, or yeah, as the package loads, the definitions have to be in order. Like this rapid object refers to other objects and I have to define those other objects before rapid can refer to them. That makes for some strangeness and I'm interested to see if they do anything to help uh, clarify that. Cause right now I have to name file, you know, I have to be careful about my file names to make sure that they go in order. Um, technically you can, you can tell the through the description, you can say what order to load files in, but I have to do one or the other. Either I have to load, name the files in order or I have to tell R how to load the files. That's a little weird. Um, anyway, so uh, the next thing you do is you name the class. So technically this the rapid on the left of the arrow 
is the name of the constructor function to create a rapid uh, object. And the rapid here is the class name. Theoretically, those could be different from one another, but I can't think of a case where that would be a good idea. Um, I guess maybe if you want to name your class name something that will conflict with an existing function, you might want to do this. I think I actually have a class named license, which conflicts with the base R function license. Um, and I thought about renaming my class, but I decided I, I don't care because the base R function license just tells you the R license. And I don't think it'll be a big deal for me to conflict with that. That could be famous last words, but that's where I am right now. Um, the next thing you do is if it's in a package, you tell it that it's in this package and uh, that helps to automatically avoid uh, name collisions. So technically my class is rapid colon colon rapid. And we'll see some cases of that where it actually prints that as the name of the class. And therefore, if someone else defines a class named rapid and they don't have a package named rapid, they define it somewhere else, it'll be a different class and it won't collide with my class. Um, you give it a list of properties. These are like the fields or the, the arguments you use to construct a new uh, rapid. And those uh, fields are auto-validated by the property or class constructor, um, which is nice. So it, it checks that they are what you say they need to be. So if, if you're expecting a character, it makes sure that they're a character and different things like that. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. Uh, you can also define a constructor. Um, theoretically, it's usually not needed, but we're going to see that I ended up doing it on, um, I think, most of my classes. Um, I just implemented that yesterday. So my notes that I'm looking at for myself right here say, oh, no, I don't do this. And actually, I do on almost all of them. And I'm still going back and forth a little bit on whether that's a good idea. And then finally, the validator. Uh, this is, uh, you know, you see this word self, like Gus was saying that uh, Rapid knows about itself. So the self here is an object that has been created, and a Rapid that has been created. And it, any Rapid, uh, when it's created or changed, so if you change a property, it goes through this validator function uh, to make sure that it still qualifies as a Rapid. Um, they don't really go into this in the help uh, so far for S7, but I th think of it as that the validator should focus on things that are like combinations of properties. And then you should uh, define classes or properties that deal with the individual property um, validation. It just makes more sense to me that way. And we'll see in my code that that's how I worked things. And so validators uh, are really where you concentrate on things that have to happen together. So um, I have a lot of cases where, uh, well, actually I'll, I'll hold that until the screen with the validators. So uh, we can go into what that means. All right, so expanding out that out a little bit. So on this object, I have this rapid object and it has properties of info servers, path, uh, webhooks, components, security tags, and external docs. Those are the pe like the top level pieces within the open API specification. Um, and in my case, they are other classes in this case that are defined elsewhere in the package, or at least uh, will be defined elsewhere in the package. So far, I've only actually implemented info and servers. And so we'll dig a little bit deeper into at least one of those probably. Uh, depending how quickly I get through everything. Um, and this is where I was talking about, like when I call this, this file, this one I'm showing actually has to be, I have it set up as like the last or second to last file in my um, file system for this package in my R folder, because all those other functions or all those other classes have to exist before this is called or there's an error. Um, and that's a little bit annoying. Uh, and you know, like I mentioned, that those properties are self-validating. So if you are trying to create a rapid, it needs an info, and that info needs to be the proper info object, which has its own uh, properties and constructor and validator. And so it it like checks that everything makes sense. 
as it goes. It, those can also, like, um, you can set it up where maybe you accept uh, a list for the info and then it'll convert it or things like that. And um, again, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go in. Uh, okay, that's everything on there. Next, the constructor. Like I said, I've been going back and forth on this, but this right now, the style on this is um, the kind of the, the technique that the tidyverse uses a lot and Arlang has functions to help do this where I accept um, info is at the front of the, the list of things because info is required. And like I said, I might relax that, but right now I'm requiring info. And then you put dots because then anything after that has to be named and it has to like be spelled right. Like you have to, it won't do partial matching um, the way that I have things set up in here because I wanna make sure that uh, number one, I'm going to I'm going to be changing the order of arguments. Possibly, I'm going to be you know adding more properties as I get more things done. Um, and so you have to. It's just making sure that um, your things are future proofed, basically. And I'm also intentionally catching anything else that people put in their definitions. Technically, you can have more things, and I want to throw an error when I go through those. APIs and see what do people put at the top level beyond the things that I'm expecting. And so that's what that check dots empty is doing is if there's any other argument than what I am expecting, uh, it will throw an error. Now, right now, if you just like tried to pass a normal, uh, you know, tried to use this with a normal document, uh, it would throw an error because there are lots of other fields that I don't have implemented yet. But um, that you know, I want that. I want to know what is it not doing right yet. And then after once I've done that check, there's just this standard S7 new object. Every constructor has to have a call to this function. Um, the first argument there is the parent class. This doesn't have a parent class, so that's null. And then you just pass in the uh, pieces. Um, the other thing to show here is it's got this class missing as the default. That is. Uh, what S7, like the the def the constructor that S7 makes by default always uses that class missing object. It's a thing exported by S7. Um, it's just, it's the same as nothing being there. And then it tells it, oh, there's nothing there. So I need to auto-generate it. Um, yes. And I think that's all the things. All right. So next is oops, is the validator. So like I said, I have been using these uh, to validate combinations of properties. Um, it takes the uh, self, so it takes the, the thing that, the object that has been created and um, you return the uh, a, a character vector of any issues. And then those character vectors will be used to throw an error message by the S7 system. Um, or you'd return null or a length zero character vector, and then that tells it, okay, there are no issues and it can go on. Um, some examples in the docs of what to put in validation, I really feel like ideally should be in uh, the property validation or the, you know, the class validation for the thing that you're using as a property, but um, Anyway, so that's what they do. Uh, but so I created these things. Uh, one of the most thing, or actually, I think, well, there there were two types of errors that I have to deal with so far. Lengths, where um, I allow you to have a length zero rapid, which means you know there, nothing is defined, but info is required. So if you try to have a um, a rapid that has uh, other things but not info, like if you try to delete the info from a rapid, that's not valid anymore. And so this validator will say, oh, that's not okay. Uh, so the way I do that is I say the key is info. Um, I could give it required things that are required to be the same length. And now I'm looking at that my highlighting is not going to line up properly. I don't think I added a line and then forgot to fix this, but, um, oh yeah, actually I know what I did, but whatever. Uh, so pretend that only key name is highlighted. 
Um, so that's the name. That's the thing that has to be there. Um, and so if it's defined, uh, other things might have to be defined. If it's not defined, nothing else can be defined. That's what that means. Uh, I do have this function in this deck if we want to go look at it uh, in a little bit. And then, yeah, I can tell it things that are required to be the same length as info. So either zero or one in this case, because info can only have length one. Um, and the other thing that's going to highlight in a second is I can also tell it to um, tell it things that can that are required and either have to be empty when info is empty or can have any length if info exists. Or I can do optional any. That's the thing that's most of these things here. So servers, paths, uh, webhooks, component security tags, external docs. Um, that uh, it's funny actually. That's not what's in the code <laughs> because obviously paths, webhooks, component security tags, external docs don't exist. So, uh, but if they did exist, they would uh, require or they they would be allowed to be any length. Um, and then you, I can also have optional arguments that have to be the same length. This one doesn't have any of those. Um, some of these arguments will make more sense if we have time to look at some other cases. And now it's going to have a highlight on nothing because I screwed that up. So, all right, uh, let's print the, if we print that function that we just created, so the constructor function, um, it says that it's an S7 class named rapid, um, that it's an S7 object, and then it has these properties. So that's just the basic printing of an object or, or of a constructor in S7. Hooray. All right. It does its thing. Uh, let's take a look at an actual object. Uh, so if you just call rapid without any arguments, it prints this big thing. Um, so one of my first to do's, actually, the next thing I plan to work on is print methods because this is already uh, hairy and ugly, and it's a lot of information about something that has nothing in it. Um, and so I'm going to make print methods that are less intense. Um, this is going to, you know, it's not that big of a deal now, but once the whole thing is defined, these can be gigantic, especially if we get into an actual call where you um, are defining the full object, which is what I'm showing here. Well, not even the full object, but it's info and servers. And when that prints, uh, sorry, and that's here's the info definition. You can see that it itself uh, has some objects like the contact and license are uh, objects that are being defined. Servers is defined with you know, a list of URLs and or a vector of URLs, vector of descriptions. And they're also an object that I'm not showing here. But when you print it, um, you know, this is good, already getting really big. And this is a little fake. Uh, API that doesn't actually have anything, you know, doesn't do anything, doesn't have any endpoints. Um, so I do have to define this print method still. Um, and I haven't decided what that looks like yet. So if anyone like has ideas, that is definitely something I would like to hear. Um, I think I want to go with something kind of like, uh, like um, tidy models, the recipes and workflows and different things like that give you like a summary of what the object is at that point. Um, and you can drill and you can drill into it and find out more info. I think theirs don't really tell you how to drill into it, which is something I want to not replicate. I wanna have a little bit more info there about how to see the full details, um, but I don't wanna show Every day, you know, every piece of the whole definition because this is uh, fairly ridiculous. So, all right. Um, oh, and yeah, that's just that's the info piece, that's the servers piece. All right. So next, uh, I have like, yeah, I couldn't use a nice uh, package to generate my slides because um, this is a weird, weird, weird package, and it would definitely break Gus's package to do that. Um, but I did put everything in here. And so, uh, you know, uh, what do we, what do we want to see? Actually, I, I want to show you the file system and then we can talk about other things, but, um, so the annoying aspect with this that I, uh, discovered is like, you know, I have some properties that are used in, um, sorry, properties that are used in various uh, classes 
So those have to be defined first because they're called by various classes. And so that's in my zero, zero properties. And then I wanted the info, like each of the pieces to be together. So I put like a prefix name and then kind of the order within that. So I have the first level is contact and license. And then, okay, the last, the final thing is ZZ info versus servers uh, has like a zero one and then zero one is inside of zero two. And so I had to put the zero two there to make sure this is defined before that. And then the ZZ server. And then finally at the very bottom here, I have ZZ rapid, which is the final, the top level object. Um, all the other things that aren't weirdly named can go anywhere because they are actual functions that are called like functions. And so they don't need to be defined um, before they are called. Uh, but yeah, that is that is the weirdest thing that I've had to deal with so far. I haven't raised an or actually I did raise an issue about that and they haven't I haven't heard a comment back on that one yet. Um so anyway, that's just something like a, a caveat. If you are using a seven in a package, there is there's weirdness that you have to deal with in that way. Um is there anything else in particular that people are interested in? I know. Gus came off of mute for a little bit there and then went back on mute. So oh, I just, yeah, it would be great if someone wrote a package to help you make presentations. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will have some issues to open. Um, I do. I didn't have time because I completely forgot that I was giving this presentation and I had a bunch of work to do on Rapid itself before I could put the package or the presentation together. And I knew it would break, so I didn't have time to actually okay. run uh, 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 what did you call it? Um, slide down, uh, I package have, or package slides, package slides. Okay. Yeah. I didn't have, I didn't have a chance to, to run that, uh, yeah. and see how badly it breaks because <laughs> I'm sure I will have issues. And it's just that it's yeah. a new, you know, S seven's weird S seven. Uh, that's another thing to just point out. It breaks uh coverage test coverage can't understand what's happening uh with the s7 stuff and so that's been somewhat annoying um i think that's the only thing that is still breaking for me but it that's been aggravating do you um, sorry when you validate are you validating later or are you validating instantly uh what can you what do you mean by that exactly so like in s7 the validator function runs whenever you change the object but if you need to change multiple properties that would conflict in an intermediate state then you can tell it to validate later right uh so i am um always instantly validating but as I get into things, I might have uh, functions that do group setting, like that that deal with that, deal with the validating later. Um, but I don't think I would do it anywhere in the class itself. Um, we'll see if that comes up. I'm trying to think. I don't think I have anything left where I am telling it, no, don't validate this, because I have to do things first. Um, I there's a lot of things that I thought I needed. And then as I worked on it more, I'm like, oh, no, I'm doing that wrong. Um, so that is something that has been, you know, it's definitely been a learning experience. Um, I wanted to hop to, did want to show. Um, so something that I realized that was causing me a lot of, like my brain was breaking, is I was trying to make the class like the constructor smart and like you could pass in, for example, the URL to an uh, API definition, an API document, and it would create a rapid from that. And um, I realized, wait, what I am doing is the as rapid function. So um, why is this? Oh, wait, no, I'm not sure why this is aligning wrong. Um, but so this is, uh, 
a whole, I, I created this as rapid, as rapid generic, um, and I did a bunch of other as generics. Um, and so this is that function, new generic, and it's named as rapid, and you call it with as rapid, and it, has, it disp dispatches on X. And so that like creates your generic function. You can do fancier things, but I'm not here. Um, and then, so I have a, <laughs> The first thing I did was I, I made all these and I forgot to give it a um, a method for rapid. And so if you said as rapid for a rapid, it would throw an error. Like you can't turn a rapid into a rapid. What are you crazy? Um, but so I had to go through and create that. And then it'll take a list. So if you read in an API document, it can um, check that. So I have this function validate for as class which takes the object and basically just checks, does X have at least one um, member in it? Like, is it a list or a character vector? It'll also work with, and does one of the elements in that list uh, match the names that Rapid is expecting? And so you can pass in any object and it checks that. Um, and it gets rid of anything that isn't. So for right now, if you have extra fields, I just throw them away. Um, I will deal with them later, but right now I want to be able to just throw them away and that way I can load a document and see if it works for what I've done so far. Um, so it does that and then it just takes it and, you know, explicitly says, okay, I want as info of the, um, the info field within that thing. And I want as servers for the servers field within that thing. And obviously those have their own, uh, ways of dealing with what they, or whatever is there. Um, but then I also, for rapid, if you uh, wrap a URL in the URL function, that gives it class URL. Um, and so if you do that and you pass it to as rapid, it will download that file and then uh, use the, um, you know, turn it into a list and then pass that and it'll go up to the as class or as rapid for a list. Um, so I have that and I've been playing with that and it works. And so this is like functional at this point because you can use this as rapid, pass in a URL and turn a any URL into a rapid, except obviously it only has a couple of fields so far, but I think I've worked through most of the bugs that I can pretty quickly get the rest of the fields done. Um, and then if, uh, if, there's class missing or null. I just return an empty rapid. Uh, within S7, it should be possible to do this as class missing pipe null, um, but uh, that's actually a bug and Hadley today fixed it based on my uh, uh, issue that I opened on it. So coming soon, th these will be able to combine into just class missing pipe null and it's one definition. And then class any is the leftovers. Um, I don't actually need this, like S7 will throw in its own error, but um, I, I didn't like the error that they throw. So I capture it and just throw my own error of uh, can't course X to, uh, and it tells you what class X is to a rapid. Um, all right, so that's, yeah. So I have one of these, these as functions for every class that I've defined. That's been something that realizing that that should exist was a big piece of uh, making stuff make sense, I think. And then the other thing that I wrote for pretty much everything is a length uh, method. And this I had to do as the old style S3 length dot rapid rapid um, because length is a primitive, not a generic technically. And so, S7 can't see that it exists and doesn't understand how to dispatch on it. Um, I'm pretty sure that's a bug. And so I need to report that, but I needed to kind of characterize it better. But it's the reason I want this is um, a rapid, like an empty rapid has all the pieces, all the empty pieces inside of it. And so those pieces count as uh, if you just do length, it'll say, oh, it's got all these other, it has all these properties. And I'm like, no, no, it's a length zero rapid if you don't have anything to find inside of it. So that's what's going on there. Um, yeah. 
trying to think if there's anything else. I, I do want to mention the, um, you know, the summary in stuff that, you know, a, a rapid is an R API definition. Um, they're defined by open API documents and they follow the open API uh, schema, the um, open API specification. Um, S seven objects. Uh, the the thing that is nice is that they are. I don't know that I like about them is that they validate their input and, and including if you change a property, it makes sure that it's still valid uh, in context. Um, and having that thing standardized. Um, why is that? Oh. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, never mind. That is how it's supposed to be. Um, once they are standardized, I can use those to uh, generate code. And what does that mean? Well, um, uh, that'll what that means will come at the end of this list. I forget this is incremental now. Um, so the first thing I need to do is finish enough of Rapid to work with. Um, like I said, I really want to get print working just so that while I'm working with it, the things printing out are not four screens long. Um, and so that's going to be the next thing I do. And then I'm going to implement uh, the components piece, specifically the security piece inside of the components piece uh, and the security, because those are what I need for my first uh, checkpoint on the package that I'm working on. Um, and th so those would let you like access an API. Now, you won't be able to do anything with the API yet, but it'll let you access it. Um, and so I can set up like the caller for the API. Uh, this is gonna be a little bit complicated because there's that there's the security field that's at the top level and it is a reference to something inside of components. But I think that with the validator, that'll be fine. Except um, that's that goes with what Gus was pointing out that if you change the components object, you might make the security object briefly invalid if you're gonna then also change the security. And so that'll be something where I actually get to experiment with that don't validate quite yet type of situation. Um, so that's that. And then, uh, you know, get it up on CRAN. Um, probably can't push it to CRAN or at least I wouldn't feel right pushing it to CRAN until I finish uh, all of the pieces, like all of the main, um, classes within Rapid, uh, but I do plan to try to get it to CRAN before too long. Like I said, I feel like I have worked out most of the tricks, which means I'm probably gonna run into something huge soon, but so far it seems pretty, seems to be working pretty well. Um, and so I'm hoping to be able to get that knocked out pretty quick, but at least the security piece. And then I'm going to be using that to develop uh, Beekeeper and get Beekeeper on CRAN. So, Beekeeper is this package that I'm working on to uh, take an API definition or, well, yeah, API definition and create a package out of it for that API. Um, the, the, you know, Rapid, all of this stuff that's in Rapid was originally going to be part of Beekeeper and I decided to spin it off. Um, I have uh, a checkpoint that I'm trying to reach because there is money attached to that checkpoint. And so that one very soon, what I hope to have is the 0 0.1 that can read the document and create uh, all the infrastructure to call uh, an endpoint on an API. You would still have to give it like the actual endpoint and the arguments to the, the endpoint. Um, so it won't have everything quite yet, but it'll check um, for some basic security schemas and tell you, oh, you you know, you need to have this token or you need to uh, set up this login system or things like that before it'll work. Um, so that should be coming uh, hopefully next week. Uh, and then also as part of that, there's a separate package ne Nectar, which will also be getting to 0 0.1 and going to CRAN because it's used, the plan is for the packages that Beekeeper generates will use Nectar as like the thing that they import um, that does all the combinations or all the, like it's basically a wrapper of HTTR2. Um, also within the next uh, like week and a half, I plan to get that done. Um, and the reason that that's all within the next week and a half or so is uh, Monday, I a week from uh, a week from Monday, I am taking Headley's um, 
package developer masterclass at PositConf. And I'm hoping to have either Rapid or ideally Beekeeper will be like what I am working on in that uh, uh, workshop. So hopefully you're going to see a lot of development soon. I'm actually going up early to Chicago and spending um, a few days just in a hotel to work on package authoring. So uh, hopefully we'll see a whole bunch soon. And then as I was working all, on all this, I realized that there's a third package or I guess a fourth and kind of a fifth package to grow out of all of this that I might make. Uh, any API. So the idea is instead of making a package, what if I just make like a kind of a temporary package that you give me an API URL um, or you choose it using the apis.guru list of all the URLs or like pretty much every API that exists. And I just like make an accessor for it in place uh, for whatever you're looking for by reading the document. And then you can use that to uh, call the API and do things with it. So that's a package that might come into existence. Um, I think that as I'm writing Beekeeper, I'm going to kind of get that package for free, kind of. Um, and so hopefully that's coming soon as well. Um, and it is just after the hour. So I will bring up the contact that there's rapid slash issues uh, on GitHub. If you have any, if you play with it or you have ideas or just from seeing this, you have thoughts, um, please, you know, let me know there. If you're watching this on YouTube, come to r4ds.io slash join and join our Slack and we can discuss all kinds of things, all kinds of things related to this or anything are related, um, I guess, or Julia or Python now. Um, you can find me on social media at John the Geek, except for that one that used to be called Twitter. Um, Fittingly, I think called Exeter now would be the, the proper name for it. Um, but I am on Mastodon, LinkedIn, uh, Threads, technically, although I don't think I have that on my phone anymore, uh, and Blue Sky. Or uh, you can email uh, us, like the R4DS community, at r4datasci at gmail.com. Or you can email me, which I forgot to put on this slide, but I'm johnthegeek at gmail.com. Um, yeah, so you know we're over time, but I've got time if anyone has any questions. Um, and I, like I said, this dot deck, rpds.io slash rapid talk, it has a slide for, um, actually, if I guess I can show, um, that should be showing up that it's got, you know, slides for all the different methods. It has slides for the classes, for the pr properties that I made that probably might turn into classes actually, um, for all these weird internal functions. Um, and yeah, the, everything else is stuff that we saw. Um, and thank you, uh, Tanache said that, uh, no questions, but it sounds like a great project. I have really like enjoyed working in S7. Um, it's not perfect there. It's interesting to watch the continued, continued development on it. Um, they are doing some things with validation of properties that sounds like it might, uh, kind of let you do something in between the new property and um, well, just, you know, work with a, a base property that they pr provide, but um, do some automation or some validation. Um, and yes, uh, OOP is difficult and encouraging our folks to try out with uh, this kind of a project is going to be good for everyone. I, I agree. And so I've been reading a lot of things about uh, like functional programming and R actually does some things that are uh, kind of higher level programming, like uh, better than a lot of basic OOP systems, but you have to know what you're doing to do it right. Um, but something like S7 is built in, um, it's built in the good way. Like it does, it, it still is passing around data and it's not, uh, going to have weird state effects that you're not expecting, but it does validate uh, that it is still a member of that class. Um, you can't remain a member of the rapid, rapid, you know, the rapid class from the rapid package. If you break it, you could call yourself that, but you wouldn't actually be the thing anymore. And S7 wouldn't recognize you as that thing. So 
uh, that's nice because you like, I mean, it's nice. I, I have done the hack where you just take a data frame and add the class tibble to it. Uh, and voila, all the, um, like it, it prints like a tibble and does all the things like a tibble because you can do that slightly faster than actually calling as tibble. Um, but the reason that it's slightly faster is as tibble checks, no, but is this really something that can be a tibble? Um, and so S7 stops you from doing hacks like that, uh, which is probably good. Oh, uh, yep. So yeah, that's, that's everything. Um, and yes, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, and, you know, as usual, like I said, come to rprds.io.join to join our Slack. Uh, and yeah, so uh, Gus said, I've dabbled in each of the four OOP systems and I'm excited to see where S7 goes, especially with real world examples. 100% um, agree with that. I, I So I think, I don't think R6 is going anywhere. Um, I think stateful uh, objects still have a place for uh, certain use cases. And so R6 is useful and I don't think it needs to be updated. Um, so I don't think there's gonna be a new thing. Um, so I think R6 is R6. Um, but S7, the reason, you know, the main reason it exists is uh, well, two things that S3 and S4 both exist. S4 was supposed to replace S3, but it didn't. Um, or at least that was, I think, an original thought on it. Um, but lately, like there's the vectors package from the um, Rlib team that tries to implement some safety features into S3. And I strongly suspect that they will instead be adapting all of the tidyverse to use S7, which has the built-in safety features. And so they don't need to do their own thing anymore. Um, and so, and it has like all the rules about constructors, which are built into S7. And it has uh, just all these things that are no longer necessary. Um, I mean, there's a reason that Hadley is leading this push. <laughs> it is something that he needs for his development. And so he made a whole our consortium working group around it, or he pushed for it and got it to exist. Um, anyway, all right. I am going to let everyone go. So I will see you all on Slack. <laughs>